for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. Right. Welcome, Fade to Black. Today is January 11th, 2023. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. And welcome, everybody. We're uh, starting to dry out here in uh, Southern California a little bit. Another wave of storms about to come in. And uh, so, and and today, of course, uh, the music world was uh, shocked with the uh, passing of, of Jeff Beck and... I'm going to dedicate this show tonight uh, to Mr. Beck. And uh, I've been blasting uh, Jeff Beck all afternoon. And our guest tonight is Ron James. And Ron is a director, uh, a filmmaker, uh, a television host, and also a musician. And earlier today, uh, Ron and I were trading pictures of guitars and talking music uh, back and forth uh, right uh, before uh, the announcement uh, came today about uh, Mr. Beck. And I'd like to bring in Ron now. Ron, uh, uh, a, a crazy day. Welcome to the show. Uh, I, I miss you, my friend. How you doing? Great. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it was kind of, yeah, kind of strange that, you know, you and I were doing the six string madness uh, uh, this morning and you know, in such a great mood and, and messing with each other, uh, and talking about that. And then, and then the news broke about uh, the passing of Jeff Beck and, uh, had, you know, you're a musician, you've got a great guitar collection, you're a player. Um, you've invited me to play on some of your tracks, uh, over the years too, as well. How'd you take the news today? You know, it's interesting. It was right after you and I were having our guitar, uh, um, shoot out. And then I ran across it. Um, and uh yeah i mean you know he was uh he was a ripe old age but still it was hard to uh take and it was very unexpected yeah yeah totally and you know 78 years old uh okay all right so we can you know say those normal things well man he lived a great life 70 but he was he was playing and touring uh right now you know he was you know still it was oh, that's at, true yeah he was at the top of his game and I went back, uh, and then we'll we'll get to let's talk UFOs tonight, right? <laughs> so we're going to do that, but um, everything is connected. Um, I went back. Uh, one of my favorite concert uh, uh, videos, uh, I mean, of all time, is Jeff Beck live at Ronnie Scott's, and, uh, and when you look at uh, his performance, there, this is a modern. It's not a. It's not an old uh, concert. I think it was shot ten years ago, uh, so he was almost seventy years old when he shot that, and he never sounded better, right? And uh, you know, he had the, the most amazing band backing him up, and uh, Tal w Wilkenfeld uh, on bass. Uh, just a great, uh, just just a great thing. And so I, I blasted that today in the studio. Just, just heartbroken. I mean, for me, I'm crushed. He's such a big, big part of uh, my musical palette, and he was somebody that I always went back to. So, um, who uh, I wanted to ask you, you've got a pretty, pretty wide uh, guitar and instrument co uh, collection. Who was your uh, big influence growing up as far as guitar players go? Well, Van Halen, obviously. Um... And then, of course, uh, going back further than that, Jimmy Page. Yeah. Yeah, 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 Page. See, you know, I, I thought about that today um, when I, I did the the post out there in, in social media, and I went, you know, I called him the guitar god. And and I thought about that for a second. I thought, well, you know, what about, what about you know, Jimmy Page? Or what about, what about, and I did. that. Those thoughts went through my mind. And then I thought, and I don't think I'm wrong here. 
all those guitar players out there, it's Beck that they look to, right? <laughs> it's you know, it's they, true. You know, I mean, you know, he was a pioneer and a legend, and an inspiration to a lot of the guys that are that are out there now and that really came up in the uh, in the seventies that yeah. that we we grew up with ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you talk to any of those dudes, you know, you, uh, you know, uh, Clapton or or Page or you know any of those greats, they go, well, you know, I, I'm I'm good. I'm I'm no Jeff Beck, but you know I can play, <laughs> and, and guitar players get it right. They they watch and listen to Jeff, and they go, "Man, I wish I could do that." So there you go. All right, so uh, you've got a new film out. It's called Accidental Truth, and I, I do want to talk about the ideas behind the film. Uh, the 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 website and and the link for that are throughout social media with us, also on our website and in the description uh, box uh, below. So you can go and check that out. The trailer for the film is about to be released. Um, so check back and when the trailer hits uh, the website and starts to hit social media, we'll uh, uh, let everybody know. But the title of the film is an interesting one, Accidental Truth. So what is that? Well, you know, the uh, in the film, the definition of accidental truth, and I probably won't get it exactly even though I wrote it, but an accidental truth is what happens when a combination of statements and evidence leads somebody to a conclusion that was not originally intended to be revealed. And basically, we have the front-facing guys that we've seen, everybody from Lou Elizondo, Chris Mellon, all the way to the sitting uh, congressional committees and Congress people, uh, all kind of trying to continue this story for whatever reason uh, that just isn't holding water anymore. And so in their own words, they say things that through slips of the tongue, through things that they decided to go ahead and reveal to me that, that they hadn't said publicly anywhere else that are really giving them nowhere else to go but to finally start admitting in a concrete manner what's really going on. In other words, you've got guys right now that there's a little bit of air still between the, oh, it's ET or, oh, it's this or, oh, it's that. They're coming right up to that wall. And there's a little bit of space that's still there in between that barrier and what they're able to say. When this film comes out, they're not going to have any space left whatsoever. It's time to spill the beans. All of us in this field, and, and you're in the film commenting on this, all of us in this field have been extremely frustrated for a long time. And when I first started to make this film, I was really kind of like, you know, as much as I hate to say it, and as much as I don't want to have this mentality, this really is a war. This is a war for the most important knowledge to humanity. And we're looking at guys sitting across a table from them that hold these keys. And somehow we've gotten to the point where we just accept that you can be this close. I can be this close. Jimmy, you can be this close. And we just have to accept that we're still not going to get the answers that we want. And my attitude has kind of changed over the course of making the film a little bit, but I really did start off in militant mode. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm tired of these lightweight UFO docs. I'm tired of people that are afraid to pull the punches and I, you know, accidental truth comes out swinging and it does not let up. And by the time it's over is like, you know, nothing against anybody. Nobody's denigrated in the film, but the body politic needs to own up and they've got no room left after this film. Um, uh, a couple of points, if I may respond to that. Um, uh, first off, uh, uh, I, I am in the film. I don't know what I, I say in the film or, or how much I'm in the film because I'm you're, not. You're the there for a couple of clips. And yeah, yeah, but, but my point is, this is my point with that. Um, we, we talked for quite a while. Uh, 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 we shot uh, for a minute. And, and I said some things where I, um, overall, I, I didn't hold back. I, I could tell where, uh, it's somewhat, I should say, where your mind was coming from, but I didn't have a real idea of the, the overall flavor for the film. I didn't know. But uh, I, I, re I do remember this. Uh, you and I having many phone calls after that. And I was like, man, Ron, woof, man, woof, where's this coming from? <laughs> right? You were 
um, you were on a mission. And and then I I was forced to think, what did I say? Because I know where his mind is right now. What is it that I say? I know that. And but that's that's what the film is is based on. And and I am sure that whatever I said, the context uh, is w- was on point, and uh, you know a little small contribution, but it will will help carry the the flavor of of what's going on. Well, it really does. You uh you you shared uh, your response when the uh, 2017 stories dropped. You were driving your car, uh, and right. th- that's a little bit funny what you said. And then um you summarized what's happened over the last few years. You know, here we are, we have no new anything. And, and, you know, all of the stuff that, uh, that came and went with great promise and total lack of delivery. And so you, uh, you came in very handy in the film to summarize a couple of those things. Well, and, yeah, uh, okay. again, let me comment on that because, um, I'm not a, I'm not a prophet or a soothsayer, right? I'm not, but, um, the things that I have, uh, the, the said back in 2017, I think they still hold true today, Ron, in that don't go all in on anything. Let's right. just wait. Let time be the judge here, right? Uh, none of us in the U- U- UFO community or anything uh, need to be the judges. Let's just see what happens. But what I didn't think, though, was that back in 2017 that we would be here six years later in 2023, um, still kind of sitting on our hands somewhat. Not to say that there hasn't been progress, but it's it, it's a pretty strange feeling knowing that six years we've almost let get by us, right? Yeah, and it's gone by so fast and there's been so many distractions. But also there's been all of these false starts. You know, the 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 only thing that's been accomplished in the body politic moving the UFO agenda forward is the creation of new acronyms. It, it's like, well, you know, okay, it's this department, it's that department, it's a new department, it's a bunch of people. And in the film, we catch these guys red-handed and, and, and expose them in a most embarrassing manner of the way that they've just managed to take advantage of this to compartmentalize information. Uh, well, that doesn't fall under the purvey of my particular task force. And it's like, dude, enough already. And, and then we also point out that the what, what we call the new narrative is the same story we got back when General Samford in the, in the 60s was talking about the Air Force's involvement with UFOs. It's almost verbatim. They didn't even have the money to hire a new script writer. They just used the same script. It's, it's, it's really sad. Yeah, you're right about that. Now, I want to, uh, uh, to expand on that uh, uh, with this next uh, few questions, which is this. Ron, you, um, you have done thousands of interviews. I don't know how many hours of programming of television uh, that you have done. I have no idea. It's a big, big, big body of work. And you have interviewed every player here. So, uh, and and for those that may not know, you, uh, a lot of stuff stays on the cutting room floor, right? It but does. But you are listening and you are there, you know what is, you know, what has been um, uh, immortalized on, on, on film or audio forever, but you're able to go and connect the dots, right? You're, you, you go back and, wait a minute, this... This was said. Exactly. This was said. And is that where the idea for the film came from? Yeah. Uh, well, the title Accidental Truth came to me because of an interview that I did with Lou Elizondo. And I actually had one of the only sit down, properly lit, professionally set up interviews with him because he was so tied up with TTSA and History Channel. So you can see lots of Lou Elizondo interviews that are out there that are Skyped in and things like that. But I had the the, the real setting and there was a lot of interest in that interview. But while I was questioning him, he, he, as he said something. And then when I asked him to clarify his answer, it was one of those oh, oh crap moments. And it's caught right there on camera. And it's uh, and that's where I got the, the, the idea for the title Accidental Truth is that, you know, sometimes we will reveal something in what we don't say. Sometimes we will reveal something in what we say accidentally. Uh, and sometimes we'll reveal something just by a slip of the tongue. And so that gave me that idea. But then as I'm going back through my stuff, uh, 
you know, like I've got three interviews with Nick Pope dating back to 2009. And it's really interesting to hear these guys' story evolve. Same thing with Colonel John Alexander. I interviewed him in 2009. And then I interviewed him again in 2018. And then again in 2019. And again in 2022. And this is a person whose story has completely uh, changed over time. And we, we illustrate that with their own words. And so it's interesting with, with Colonel Alexander um, is that he was out making the rounds to the UFO community a lot and saying that, you know, he believed that more study should be permissible and blah, 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 blah. But we find out in 2021 that he was actually running a program just like the kind that he was officially denying the whole time he was walking around in this community pretending to, to be like, like he was an ally. And at the end of the day, was he an ally in his own way? For sure. Um, but, you know, the line gets blurred and where where I might have originally when I started on this film, I might have said, oh, yeah, that's that's crap. This guy's been out there doing this stuff for this whole time. He's he's been part of a disinformation and a, a campaign of deception and shame on him and shame on all these other people that are doing this. And I kind of uh, started to see things from another angle also and kind of understand that maybe that's kind of how they just had to be and what started out as a really militant film where we're going to get these guys kind of turned into a gentle expose. You know, I'm not a, there's nobody getting denigrated or attacked in the film, but they're certainly getting exposed. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, we, we all, when I say we all, you know, our community, but I think that the world now understands that, you know, something's going on in the skies and, and it's not us and it's coming from somewhere. But uh, if you've seen something that you can't explain, uh, like I have and so many others have, um, it forces you onto the road of uh, discovery and in a seeker of knowledge. So we have that side of things. And then we have everything else. What, is, what ultimately are these agendas? Is it agenda? Is it an agenda for truth? Or is it to obscure and and present something else? Well, if you're talking about the agenda that, that we're seeing unfold in the human realm, uh, I think that there's uh, there's warring factions even to this day, and we actually call that out in the film. When when Lou and Chris came out in 2017, there it rather people want to say they're part of an organized disinformation campaign and they're playing their part, or they really did want to start bringing this to the public. Uh, that, that's debatable and, and we can have that discussion. But the fact of the matter is that whatever we're being told, there are factions that do not want us to be told anything. And so you've got this internal fight going on at the very deepest levels and also in, within the Air Force, within the a little bit of the military. But most of this is obviously hidden away from even the rank and file military. Mm -hmm. But there, there is a, you know, there, there, there is not agreement about what we should be told about what should be revealed. And there is infighting going on. And we illustrate that and we kind of prove it in, in, in the film with some of the stuff that happened after Lou came out and how he was disavowed, how he had to hire uh, Danny Sheehan to go into the Defense Intelligence Agency and make them take back that he was a fraud and that he did, hadn't done his stuff that he said he did. Um, so that there is no fixed agenda. It's, it's very clear that we're going to have to confront the reality that there are non-human or maybe even another type of human intelligences that we don't know that are interacting with our planet and probably with us. This is, this is a given. And at some point, if they don't figure out a way to, to, to clue us in officially, you know, Elon Musk is going to land right in the middle of an ancient city on Mars and, and the beans are going to be spilled. So they can't keep it going for, for long. But the problem is they can't just come out and say, oh, yeah, well, you know, yeah, we've known about this since. Well, the, the Pope knew about it back in the church and before uh, they started even having technology. All of recorded history, we've had UFOs. And, and this secret has been sequestered away. They're not going to be able to keep it a secret for too much longer, but there's a whole lot of disagreement about what we're going to be told, how we're going to be told, and when we're going to be told. 
and it's 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 bubbling to the surface to the point where it's evident through, that you can just see it happening. The uh, let me ask you a couple of questions. Uh, this, this may be opinion and also maybe something that you that you know, but um, but your comment is is valuable. The the story the the storyline in in 2017. Um, not only coming directly from TTSA, but from those around them uh, as well, saying the same thing. Uh, there's there's going to be more videos. There's going to be more evidence. There's going to be more witnesses coming forward. There's going to be so much. This is what, and, and this entire, and at the time, we were buying into it, and we had to. We had three Navy videos that, that made it out, and we had uh, people coming forward like Lou and and David Fravor, and you know later Alex Dietrich, Ryan Grace. You know, it's a long list. And then the brakes completely got pumped, right? And and it, it it stopped, and it didn't stop after a couple of years. It stopped after a couple of months, and we've literally have had six years with nothing. Yeah, we kind of explained that in the film that when when these guys got their momentum and the story got so big so fast, there were factions within within the the managers of this information that were like, hold on, wait a minute. They got blindsided. They didn't they didn't know how to react. They didn't have time to react. But then they got time to get they, off of their back feet and form a strategy to combat this and to limit what is going to be put out. The, the, the story grew so fast and there were some lines that got crossed. Like when the New York times did the follow-up story about materials uh, mm -hmm. being held. Uh, okay. That was a red line. You cannot go there. That, that was never part of the agreement that you can all of a sudden say, we've got materials from crashed UFOs. Uh, and so that was way beyond where there were, anybody was willing to let it go that had any th control over it whatsoever. So they immediately started walking that stuff back. They had to print the retraction in the New York times. We had Susan Guff coming out from the Pentagon, uh, walking back the whole materials story, but the, the cat was already out of the bag and it's been just a dog and pony show ever since. The, um, uh, was there ever in your mind's eye, was there a single point of information because we we had different versions of all of this being spoken of at the same time, where a, a, normally, and let's say I'll take something uh, very basic, right? Let's say we all go to a friend's birthday party, right? And we have a group of friends there. Later on, a month, a year on down the road, and we go back and talk about the birthday party, we may not all have the exact recollection, but the source of the story, you know, you know what I mean? There's going to be a, a general thing that you're not going to get wrong. Well, th there were statements and things that were being made from uh, people in the middle of this that were complete opposites and, and were not making sense. And then even those reversed Right. And 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 by the time you get to the end of it, uh, you can't you can't really make sense of anything because nobody has got a basic point source of information. Yeah, it's kind of that way by design. Ralph Blumenthal is in the movie. I went to New York and I interviewed him and and he's instrumental in telling the story from his point of view. And for those that don't know who he is, Ralph Blumenthal is the, the New York Times writer that broke the ATIP story. And. In the film, he tells a story about how Leslie Keen was invited to a private meeting with Lou Elizondo, with Christopher Mellon, were to talk about UFOs. And that's Lou had just written his resignation letter to the uh, to the Defense Department, but he had not given it to them yet. And this was a you know kind of this is what we know. This is this is a program that's been run that nobody knows about, and um, and that's what was the nexus for the story being broken, but it wasn't a spontaneous thing. This was, this was orchestrated through these guys coming together, Chris and Lou coming to the media. And for a while, the story got, it got massaged. It's like, how are we going to get it into the times? How are we going to get the times to go ahead and print it? And there's a whole backstory to how that happened. And there's a case to be made 
that this was part of an organized rollout and that Lou and Chris were just kind of front men for this organized rollout. And there's also a case to be made that that's not really the, the truth and that they had just decided we're going to leave government. We're going to take what we can say and what we can't say, and we're going to start doing what we can to get this to the public. And so there's two different ways of looking at what happened back in those days. And there's two different ways of looking at the motivation of these two gentlemen. Uh, I find it very interesting that uh, shortly after the story broke, all of a sudden here comes TTSA and these guys are already organized. Is They didn't just organically pop up right after the New York Times story. They were years in the making to put this thing together. Lou and Chris and Jim Semivan and all these guys from, from the intelligence community, Hal Putoff, these Steve are all guys. Justice. Yeah, Steve Justice. Yeah. yeah these yeah. are all guys that were involved in this stuff for ages. Hal Putoff and, and Colonel John Alexander were running programs to study UFOs back in the 70s, just within a very short window after Project Blue Book closed. And and so a big thing that we cover in our in our film is that w what we call the new narrative. The new narrative that came out in 2017 is we have these things. We don't know what they are. They're not ours. They're not adversaries. We think they might be a threat, so we're going to have to take it seriously and investigate it. But the biggest part of the new narrative is that there was nothing going on after Blue Book before ATIP. And so we go in there and we dig the crap out of that. And what we're able to prove, we, we've we're able to identify the programs. We're able to identify the people that ran the programs. We're able to identify what they studied. We're able to identify what they found. And it's it's profound. And through admissions of their own and through freedom of information. Um, so what happens in Accidental Truth is that the the deception just gets completely undermined and the truth about these programs, because that's where the that's where the truth lives. It lives between the end of Blue Book. Well, actually, before the beginning of Blue Book, but it, it and and a tip, and they're whitewashing that entire history, and they're doing it for a very specific reason, and that is to to reframe the narrative and to abolish anybody that's involved in this stuff uh, from any kind of responsibility, and so part some of them are dying off, but there's still an institutional responsibility that has to be whitewashed. So we can come out in 2017 and say, oh, the Navy's studying this stuff. And all of a sudden, oh, here's these DIRDs, these defense intelligence reports about all these technologies that came out of Bigelow Aerospace. Here's these materials reports that, with logical explanations about where all this stuff came from. What we're really seeing in that release is we are seeing the information that these guys gleaned from before Blue Book until ATIP, over these years, all these top secret back engineering programs, all these crash retrieval debris uh, studies, all these material studies, all these things that these guys were doing, how do we get that information out in such a way as we can say, oh yeah, well, we just found this stuff. It's just like we we talk about night and all the, the shape-shifting alloy that it was supposed to be around Roswell. We go back and we prove that it didn't come from where they say it came from and that it very likely came from a, some kind of a UFO crash. So they're, they're whitewashing the past so they can deny these programs existed. And they're using the cover of Bass, Bigelow Aerospace, uh, the, the Freedom of Information Act requests about material studies to come up with a new explanation for how this knowledge and information was obtained so that they don't have to take responsibility or accountability or even tell the truth for what they did in the past. And, and so that's what we're seeing. That's what started to unfold in 2017. Rather, Lou and Chris and, and those in TTSA are intentionally carrying that, which, you know, obviously, um, they're, they're certainly not telling us what they know. Hal Putoff is not telling us what he knows. We know him and, and Alexander were working way back. Uh, same thing with all these guys. So they've come up with a very clever way to say, oh, yes, there's all these materials that, that may have. We don't know what they came from. Maybe they came from off-world craft. They could have. Uh, there's all these technologies that we have spent a ridiculous amount of time studying. But they're not going to tell us where that stuff originated because they can't. And so here we go. That's yeah. what Accidental Truth unveils. 
Um, oh man, I'm going to ask you a very direct question. Do you feel that a tip was a staffed venture that there was a staff underneath Lou Elizondo, that he was the director of people that were researching uh, information, eyewitness testimony and videos and imaging and sensor data, or was ATIP a party of one and he was the director of himself? Well, it's kind of probably somewhere in between. And and let me explain what I mean. Uh, One thing that I learned through the investigations that I've done is that they would there's these groups that they call ad hoc where say you're a high ranking government official with an interest in UFOs. Well, you can put together a group of a whole bunch of other high ranking government officials and you can all have security clearances and you can have secret meetings and you can do, you can run programs, but they don't have to be ever official programs. So they, 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 they call it ad hoc programs where there's no official sanction to this program, but it still exists. It still has all the benefits of your access to technology, your access to security, your access to secrets, and can be run just like an official program. But it's not it, it's on that borderline of, well, it's not official. And that's how they're able to do a lot of these things that and burying them within private industry that makes it so that they don't have to admit it. So. I think what happened and, you know, I've talked to Lou about it and I've talked to others. And so I can I'm going to venture my opinion. But what it seems happened is that Lou was involved with the OSOP program, which was the contract awarded to Bigelow Aerospace. He was brought on into that program. He had a role. It was a real thing. They they are the group that released the. 1500 pages of reports on all kinds of esoteric technologies. Um, So that was a real thing. And it was a real government contract. And then at some point, it slipped into DOD. The the BAS contract ended. The program still continued. Now, it can be debated rather it was, well, you know, they say that ATIP was kind of a nickname for it. And Lou had a portfolio of things that he was working on. It wasn't just that. But the program did continue. The same people were still involved. But it was somewhere in between an official program and an ad hoc program. It didn't the the twenty million dollars that Bigelow Aerospace got. I don't think that Lou had that kind of budget to work with when he was running it out of DIA. And so um, the answer is somewhere in between. But yes, there it, it was a thing. Um, I have um, because when I look at, at things o- uh, overall, and these are the same comments that I have today, and same questions that I had today have today. I had in 2017. And I was, you know, I had I had the dirge reports and all the OSAP information a year before that stuff was made public, and I had distributed uh, out through my friends and small network of people. You know, what do you think about this? And when TTSA uh, rolled out, and then we had this acronym, you know, ATIP uh, suddenly in play. Um, was a to the you know the big question was was a tip a version of OSAP was it a continuation of the program, but OSAP had nothing to do with UFOs, and when you go and you read all of their stuff, paranormal absolutely supernatural yeah, yeah bending spoons, warp drives right okay so all of that was well, in warp there. drives has to do with UFOs. Uh, but and, and but, so does material studies, and uh, and OSOP was doing all that stuff. But you understand what I'm saying? They weren't researching Navy videos and eyewitness testimony with UFOs. No, they were doing research studies, projecting out 50 years in the future where they thought that uh, we may be in a in a uh, in in technology, which is fine. I don't have any issues with that. It was a great reading, but uh, a tip wasn't OSAP. Right. In that a, a square can be a rectangle, but a rectangle. Yeah, so here's how that was explained to me. The uh, when they were when they were doing the OSOP work, they had what the, was called like a wide spectrum of stuff that they were investigating. All the stuff at Skinwalker Ranch, all the paranormal stuff like you're talking about. There was a UFO element to it. Um, it as a matter of fact, there was a time when MUFON was brought in to go and travel to UFO sighting hotspots and provide the information to Bigelow. And so there was a UFO element to it, but by the time it, uh, Lou was involved and then by the time the program disintegrated, it was decided that they were just going to 
uh, stick with the UFO stuff in what got carried on into the Defense Intelligence Agency. The other things were, as Lou puts it, and he says this in the movie, it's like we're trying to um, hit an elephant with a with a sniper rifle. There's we're, there's just no way that we could process all this data and study all of these things. So as the program developed and and changed hands and, and went into uh, the the government offices that it ended up in and Bigelow and his participation kind of went by the wayside, the focus became primarily on the UAP phenomenon. Yeah, and and, and I see that. Um, but uh, th- there's a, the reason why I'm talking about the front issue, the, the part that reaches the public, right, and this communication and, and what is being presented to the public. OSAP, ATIP, Elizondo, Mellon, all of that, that's the stuff that's on the surface. That's the, the, right. the things that we can see. That has nothing, to, has zero to do with the crash retrieval of something that's out here in the Palm, you know, in Palmdale at Lockheed that's being backwards engineered. That has nothing to do with OSAP or ATIP. And the DOD or anybody else wouldn't have any idea what a subcontractor is doing. And that includes anybody that is involved with, you know, like like OSAP, which we know what that basically was about and where that funding came from, and, and ATIP. There was, you know, they, when when we talk about research and data into this subject matter, it wasn't anybody at ATIP, Ron, uh, running research and looking at sensor data of stuff that Lockheed is working on. No, they would never know that. They would never know about it. And that would never get turned around and get back to the public. Well, you're right. And because the, the stuff that you're talking about with uh, crash debris, materials, reverse engineering, Groups like like OSOP, ATIP, Project Blue Book, and 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 even uh, Colonel John Alexander's group, the Advanced Theoretical Physics Working Group, mm-hmm. these guys were were on were scratching the surface in in an official capacity, but they were never read in to the depth of you know John Alexander never got to, exactly. to talk to the guys that re, that recovered Roswell. He, he he had certain knowledge. But these guys are not the guys. They're not the people that that are deeply into this and that really hold the keys. They're just more public players with, you know, um, Lou's manager told me, and hopefully I'm not going to get in trouble for this, but he told me, you know, we're working on the ultimate UFO documentary. And I'm like, well, you're never going to be able to make it because Lou's not read in. And, and it's just true. These guys that we see publicly they're not read into to what's really going on. And, and even the guys that we think have this knowledge, they're not the guys. The people that that ported, um, you know, nitinol and transparent aluminum and some of these other things into industry, uh, you know, Corso's got his story. That's that's not even really the way it happened. And the people that that are managing this information, it is sequestered within private industry to the point. It's just like in the Wilton Davis memo. You, you're not read in. It's in private industry. You can't get to it. And so even the front facing people that we're talking to today, they are not the people. And in fact, you say that in the movie. I, I, I probably. Well, Me it's too. a point. It's that a, whoever they are, we don't know their names. They're not on TV. They're not in front of a camera. We don't know who they are. And, and, that's, and that's a Jimmy and, Church quote. And I don't think that'll ever change, right? Where no. um, it is it, when it, you bring up the Wilson Davis uh, document, and there are a couple of points in that, and I'm glad that you did. Because, you know, the John Alexanders of the world, you know, and the Oak Shannons and, and the people that were involved, you know, going back uh, to those meetings that were uh, documented from uh, 1985, where we've got Oak Shannon's notes and we've got Jack mm-hmm. House notes that turn around and support the Wilson Davis memo. And my point with uh, everybody on this is exactly what you're saying there. We'll never know the real names. Anybody that is in play here and you look at the bigot list or whatever it is, you are so not only read in, but you're so vetted to get on that bigot list or to be a part of those programs that and and your dedication to that and to this country, you are not ever 
going to say anything to anybody. And that is what the Wilson Davis document to me, uh, that's what is so important about it. Because yes. you have you have you have a rear admiral, right? You've got <laughs> you've got you've got Thomas Wilson, J two, right? That is budgeting the the SAP programs, right? He's in control of it. And and he is told, dude, go kick sand. Yeah, and they threatened him. They threatened him. And a, a J two. So, uh, yeah, I think that that is uh, absolutely the most important point about the Wilson Davis document. I believe it's an authentic document. I think that the meeting really happened uh, between Thomas Wilson and Eric Davis. Again, another name that, it, you know, keeps getting, you know, put into this. Um, and those two. Well, he's uh, a big player. Anyway. Yeah. So we cover a lot of that in the film. And and one thing that, that I've done with Accidental Truth is that it has – a lot of revelations in it that even people that are hardcore in the field are going to go, wow, that's pretty good. You really are. You're stitching it together. You're moving the ball. I didn't want to make a film that did not move the ball, but I've also made a film that will bring your average ancient aliens fan. That's not a hardcore ufologist up to speed to, to the modern day. There's been a few films like that. This is the next one. And so there's there's a lot of things your average UFO person, guys in your audience, maybe they're going to go, ah, well, I knew that. Well, I knew that. Well, I knew that. And you might know 90 percent of what's in the film, but it's never been sewn together this well. It's never been represented by the people in the film. We've got Dr. Michio Kaku, arguably the world's most famous scientist, chiming in on the specifics of all of these different technologies and how they're how they're possible. We've got Dr. Gary Nolan. Um, revealing some things that he has not revealed ever to anybody. We've got um, an interview with the, I'm the only person that's put an interview with a sitting congressperson in an independent UFO documentary. We've got Tim Burchett in Washington. I went, I sat in his office and I lined him out about all this stuff. And he's like, yeah, I know all about it. And, um, and, and, and we've got Ralph Blumenthal inside story on how that all got broken we have the exclusive interview with Lou Elizondo where he makes an absolutely stunning admission. We have Chris uh, Mellon making an absolutely stunning admission. And then we have all of the other people that uh, are in the film supporting Richard Dolan's in it. He plays a big part, but it's, I, I can tell you it's Dolan like you haven't seen him for a while. And um, yeah, I see somebody, uh, somebody saying Fox did that. Yeah. But uh, when that came out, it was uh there's been so much that's happened since then. So yeah, you have to continue to do these. Yeah. I missed the Fox comment, but I'm not wearing my glasses. So I, yeah, I, I, I think can't. last time you told me not to pay attention to the chat. Yeah. I, I try not to, it, it, it's, it's, it's too busy. They, they have a lot of fun in there. Uh, <laughs> I just can't keep up with it. Um, and, but, and, and just a dark protocol. James Fox has watched my movie twice and uh, he's, he's very impressed. Uh, who, uh, okay, so the do you have a release date, really quick? It's gonna it's gonna be sometime in mid to late March. They're gonna the, they're gonna announce the release date next week. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. The um, uh, the other part of this though, um, as as we really take a hard look, uh, John Alexander, who uh, has, has been. In in and and threaded through this entire narrative uh, for a few decades now. Um, if we go back and we take a look at uh, Jack Hawk's notes, Oak Shannon's notes, um, and and take a look at those, which predate by what fifteen years uh, the the conversation that happened between Eric Davis and Admiral Wilson. That's yeah. a fifteen year gap. But what they all say um, is that uh, ah, the president. Nah, nah, no, he's not. No, no. Politicians. Nah, no, no. Military people. Nah, not really. No, no. And it's a very interesting point that uh, the president, the vice president, <laughs> politicians don't have a need to know on this. The military doesn't have a need to know on this. This is something that is going to be independent from all of that to be kept from prying eyes and oversight. And then Tim Burchett, with his anger, and and Congress and the Senate, uh, they're here. They feel like they're hearing about this for the first time. It's by design, isn't it? 
Yeah. And I can tell you, uh, one of the things that we didn't mention at the beginning of this is that I also own MUFON Television and I am the media relations director for MUFON, which means that, you know, like right now we're working on a big episode of Ancient Aliens about MUFON. We have been in Washington, D.C., behind closed doors, having meetings. We've influenced uh, some of the new uh, protocols that are going to go into place. We helped with some of the by consulting with some of the language that went into the Appropriations Act that got passed. And we're going to have a seat at the table in these in these panels. And what we're finding is that exactly what you said, these guys really they're interested. They're angry. They don't understand why they're not. They know they're being lied to. They know they're being lied to by everybody. Some of them have a, you know, a passion for the topic and have studied it. Some of them just know there's something going on. The threat narrative is alive and well in Washington, D.C., um, but the movement by the body politic, in my opinion, is the, it's not the first time it's happened. It's not going to be the last. And at the end of the day, it's a pretty uh, it's not a effective organization to get to the truth. These guys cannot demand the truth from the people that have it because a, they don't know who those people are. Right. And B, even if they did, they're not going to put, they're not going to have the political will and the political courage to do what has to be done to push this issue. Now, what, what can be done about this? Because I am sure that if you are, sitting on a committee in the Senate or in the House, and you understand your job and responsibilities, but suddenly you're stonewalled and you don't have a direction to go in for answers, that, that's a big problem, isn't it? Where they know that there is something going on, but there is absolutely what they feel. There's nothing that they can do about it. And that's not a situation you want in, in on Capitol Hill, I would think. No, and, and in my interview with with Tim Burchett, he really lays it out that unfortunately there's only so far that any of these guys are going to go because there's a certain level of political corruption, there's a certain level of self preservation. You know, we know what happened to Admiral Wilson. He basically was told that he was going to not get a promotion if he continued to push the issue. There are people that, and there are these people that have these ways of exerting pressure when pressure needs to be exerted to back off. And a perfect example of that is um, uh, Marco Rubio. You know, let's look at that. He was he was a staunch advocate of, of a movement for truth. And all of a sudden they had that meeting behind closed doors on Capitol Hill. And it was like, Marco, crickets, nothing. Guys barely said anything about the entire topic since that meeting. And so something happened where it was like either, yeah, here's what's going on. It's time. But no. And, and you know, my guess is he walked out of there just shaking his head. Just going, yeah, you know what? I can understand why we can't tell people this stuff. Either that or he was just told, you've gone as far as you can go, back off. But he was a vocal opponent of the uh, truth embargo right up until they had those private briefings uh, to, the, uh, to the committees. And then nothing. They walked out of those briefings silent. Nobody made even a comment. And it's, it's, it's interesting. What, to what, say the least. Okay, okay. Let me ask you about that. Um, what do you think? Uh, I, obviously, this is going to be an opinion, but what do you think it was revealed in that it, at the UFO hearing? And we, we can talk more about that after the break. Um, when it was brought up by one of the committee members, um, are we going to talk about ET in the classified briefing this afternoon? That was a question at the UFO hearing, right? I want to know about ET now, but if you can't talk about ET now, is that going to be later in the classified briefing? And if we swing this over to Marco Rubio, who I remember TMZ stopped him in the airport. So what about the little green men, right? And, and Marco's like, he was willing to talk about it, you know, right there. And, and it seems that now... It's it's not there. Is it because they were told, you know, little green men, that this is something else uh, is, that is seriously going on that isn't uh, originating here on planet Earth? And is that enough to scare the crap out of a Rubio or, or somebody else? 
Well, here's the thing. I get asked this question a lot. And the question that I get asked, and, and I'll circle back to your answer, is, you know, well, what's the reason for the secrecy? And what do you think uh, the human response will be to finding out? And right. there's, there's always been this thing where people say, well, we're ready for the truth, but it's not a generic answer. And my, my response to that is it depends on the context. If you tell an entire planet that we're not alone in the universe, but there's aliens, they mind their own business, we mind ours, they're super superior to us and, and uh, you know, just move along, then people are just going to go, OK, well, we knew that and they're going to go about their day. But if you say, hey, you know, we're not alone in the universe, we don't understand the methods of these beings, they're abducting people. There, who knows what else they're up to? What, what kind? Who knows what we are? Maybe we could be food. We could be a genetic farm. At the end of the day, we're, we we could be property. If if the answer is something more along those lines, then that's going to cause widespread panic and a complete disintegration of everybody's perception of their own self importance and and humanity's importance. So the the answer to the question is, the reason for the secrecy may have to do with the context. And so if these guys are pulled back behind closed doors, it's like, look, yeah, there's a number of non-human intelligences at work here. Some of them are nefarious. Some of them might be benevolent. But the fact of the matter is that people don't need to know. And here's why. Then, yeah, they could walk out of that room and never say another word. Because I believe that they, they, are, they are being reasoned with to keep mom rather than threatened to keep mom. So in other words, you sit them down in the room and you say, this is why we can't tell people. And, and they walk out and they're like, yeah, no shit. I'm not going to do it. Right. So right. instead of, if you tell, this is what's going on. And if you tell people then uh, you know, you're going to get in trouble and you're going to get, you know, go and go to jail, blah, blah, blah. I don't think they can be threatened into silence, but I think that they can be reasoned into silence. Here's why uh, I, I agree with you. It may not be for the reasons you think though. But I want to make this point that let's look at the alternative that they are told uh, behind closed doors that it's not UFOs, that that China has made a big leap in technology and they've got anti-gravity. And this stuff that is coming into our airspace is adversarial. That would scare the crap out of Marco Rubio. For sure. And that is something that he wouldn't talk about. But here's the alternative to that. This is why that never happened. Because then Marco Rubio would have come out and said, yep, ETs are real. He's not going to say <laughs> the other. You understand what I'm saying? The, yeah. the, the excuse for all of this, the story that they would go with is that it's ET. They would never, they would not freak out the world by saying that Putin has got anti-gravity and he can time travel, whatever it may be. But no, they wouldn't come out and say that. Therefore, I don't think that that's what they were told. Right. No, I think I think that's true. And I think that the uh, I don't think that the the these other countries and adversaries have this technology. But then if you look at Tom DeLonge's book, Secret Machines, he actually postulates that that's exactly true, that we have this and this was supposed to be this big revelation novel from inside information. Um, and so I'm not saying that that I think it's correct because there's a lot about the, that series that really seems like it was just gleaned from the mythos. But the uh, you know, in in that book, uh, they have the, the anti-gravity uh, craft. Russia has them. We have them. They don't mention China, but and, and then there's an ET component that's that's involved in these craft and that this is all something that that has been, uh, you know, created from back in the uh, the days of German technology. So there is that whole timeline mythos. But you have to ask yourself if, if we really have this technology, even at the deepest secrets, uh, then, you know, why are we letting this thing happen in Ukraine? Yeah, so I, that's, the, that's the biggest point of all, Ron, right there. If 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 Putin had uh, anti gravity TR three Bs, we would see it in Ukraine right now. <laughs> yeah, it. something would be going on. We would unless see there's it. some reason we're not doing it. Uh, you no, know, I, I know you said stay out of the chat, but this guy String Gene just said something that that echoes what I was about to say. For people, you know, people could say, "Oh, they're they're lying to us. Oh, they're keeping us a secret. They've been covering it up for years," and 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 that is largely true, but. I can say that I believe 
that for the people that, in the field that really want the answers, these same people that have been keeping this secret have been peppering the answers to anybody who wants to look. They're, they're there. And so if you've dedicated your life to being a UFO researcher and that that question is burning your existence, the, there these guys are making sure that if you really want to know, yeah, you know, you can find out most of, of what's going on. You're going to have to use your own discernment to figure out what's BS and what's not. Mm -hmm. But but we have always done what we can to give information to the people that are able to look for it and willing to look for it. Uh, see what you did, Ron. Jimmy said, stay out of the chat. No, that's not, Ron's not saying that. He, well, no, let me explain that. The <laughs> last time we were, the last time I was on your show, I was literally re typing back to people in the chat. Yeah, and Jimmy was like, Ron, we're doing a show. You got to knock that off. You know, because I was like, oh, I've been typing at the keyboard and I'm responding to people. And he's like, chill out. So, so he didn't tell me N nothing against no. the chat. It no, was we me. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's not uh, that's kind of funny. See, you know, um, uh, I love it. People actually pay attention to the show, too, as well. <laughs> they pay attention to the too. <laughs> They're also listening to us. Let's take a quick break. Our guest tonight is Ron James. His new film, it's about to be released, is called Accidental Truth. And uh, be, as, I, as I get this ready, um, we will have the trailer up and out. And as soon as it is available, um, I will let everybody know. In the meantime, we're going to take this break. Be right back. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Please visit all of our sponsors. We're taking a quick break here. All of the links are below, and we'll be right back. Check out Billy Carson's Forbidden Knowledge. ForbiddenKnowledge.com or ForbiddenKnowledge.tv where you can get access to over 6,000 videos, movies, TV series, exclusive documentaries like the Black Knight Satellite. You can do it all for just $7.77 per month or $77 per year after the three-day trial, which is also totally free to check out. It's all simple to do. Billy Carson is the best. It's simple. ForbiddenKnowledge.com or ForbiddenKnowledge.tv TV. That's the number four, four BK. I will be hosting and emceeing the Conscious Life Expo this February 10th through the 13th at the LAX Hilton right here in Los Angeles, California. 200 speakers, including Linda Moulton Howe, Bashar, Deborah King, George Norrie, Daniel Sheehan, Scott Walter Shonstone, and David Wolf. Over 200 vendors, special events. This is the biggest event of its kind on planet Earth. You've got to come and hang out with all of us. Tickets and info at ConsciousLifeExpo.com. The links are below. On Saturday, April 1st, that's right, April Fool's Day, 2023, I will be hosting the Parapod Festival at the Hyatt Regency right here in Valencia, California. It's a live, one-day podcast awards. It's a film festival. It's a full-on media event. We're going to have Sky Watching. There's going to be a Lifetime Achievement Award presented to Linda Moulton Howe. Right now, you can submit your podcast, your film, your TV series, any of your paranormal media for consideration. You can do all of that on the links below. For info and tickets, go to parapodfilmfest.com. That's parapodfilmfest.com. April 7th through the 14th, 2023, I'll be hosting and presenting on the Hidden Secrets Seminar at Sea Cruise. From Los Angeles to the Mexican Riviera on the Navigator of the Seas. That's right. Up top, a giant water slide. You've got to check out the Navigator of the Seas. It's amazing. We've got Scott Walter, Adam Apollo, Nick Pope, Brad Olson, Vivian Chauvet, Jason Shirka, Robert Grant, Ruben Langdon, and another 12 amazing speakers and presenters. It's all simple to do. Just visit DivineTravels.com forward slash Hidden Secrets 2023. You know you want to go on a cruise with me. River Moon Coffee, makers of the Fade to Black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black blend, the Game Changer blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. 
All right. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Ron James. His new film is called Accidental Truth. And the trailer will be out soon and uh, like within the week. And we will hit social media with that. And of course, you can go to Accidental Truth. It's got an S, an S in there. I think it's yeah, Accidental it's Truth. AccidentalTruth.com. Truths. Because I, could, I couldn't get the singular, so I had to take what I could yes. get. So there you go. And we've got the links uh, uh, for everything. You, you can go and, uh, and there There is a little uh, trailer, trailer that I put together, but it's not the official one, and it's definitely not anything super great. But you can see it at that website, and it actually forwards you to a place inside MUFON Television. Yeah, there you go. And I appreciate that, Ron. Um, the, what is, what is the path forward, uh, now? And, uh, we've, I've got a whole list of, of, of questions here in my head, uh, about this, because if we go back to October 31st, where we had this deadline, uh, semi-official deadline that was supposed to have been written into, uh, the last budget, uh, for uh, a UFO report that that never made it uh, never made it uh, to Capitol Hill, um, do you anticipate in this path forward uh, a release of of that report that was due uh, on Halloween? Well, you know, it's interesting that they managed to sidestep that and not have to put out a report. And that just kind of shows that the tug of war that's happening within the military and government com industrial complex, the front facing guys and the puppeteers behind them. Uh, as Richard Dolan says in my film, if they can drag this out for another 50 years, they're going to do it. And what we unfortunately are just going to have to accept is that we're going to be told what we're going to be told and we're just going to have to take it and, and be happy. We're getting something. Eventually the truth will come out. Um, but who knows how long it's going to take. Uh, and who knows if we as people are going to make it to the point where we're actually deserving of that truth The you know, it, there's a lot of people that believe in this whole galactic federation idea of the prime directive from Star Trek and that there's certain things that we have to achieve on our own in the evolution of our own species and our own consciousness before we're really going to be eligible to be privy to this information and have this whole new gateway of the stars open up to us. And another thing is that, you know, toward the end of Accidental Truth, we start really exploring all of the other things that these that, that is at play. This is not just little green men from Alpha Centauri. This is consciousness. It's nature of reality. It is, it, there are things that are so profound and so deep in the way they're going to affect us that are part of this phenomenon that a lot of people can make the argument that we don't even know what questions to ask yet. I think Tim Burchett has has rubbed off on you because you you sidestepped a question. Okay, so <laughs> let's go back. Uh, but my question: Do you do you anticipate uh, the election is over? Right? There's no more excuses on on that end. Um, do you anticipate a release of that report in 2023? Well, there's going to be a release of something. I mean, I have information for sure that that's, that's going to happen. Is it going to be anything more exciting than the last one they released? Probably not. It's going to be as watered down as humanly possible. Now, right. I'm going back to Washington. The, the, the Accidental Truth Part 2 is uh, tentatively going to be called Accidentally on Purpose. <laughs> and uh, I'm actually going back to Washington, D.C. At, at the end of January, uh, there's a there's a big meeting. The MUFON board of directors is convening. We've been given offices uh, to 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 work out of as we kind of start putting together a tapestry of what it's going to look like to have a civilian entity having input into these committees and having access to a certain amount of the information and helping to work with how that's going to get dispersed. Mm -hmm. How is that going to work? I have no idea. Um, even though I'm the media relations director for MUFON, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, having a seat at that particular table is really going to be beneficial to, to our cause. The, the one thing that there's too many people in our field right now, a lot of them that have been pulled aside and been told, look, I'm going to tell you something, but you can't share it. And, and so they've traded the inside knowledge for the commitment to reveal to the public anything that they find out. And 
it's really sad to see it happen. It's widespread. Uh, I'm not going to name names, but it's more more people than it's not. And so once you become a part of the secrecy, then you're not really serving a mission to enlighten the public. And so it's happened to a lot of people in the field. I'm interested to see how this evolves in Washington, how these different groups play out. You know, we've got NASA. Oh, they're going to start studying it. I mean, give me a break. You know, they covered up life on Mars in 1976. So who, who is NASA to come forward and, and say, oh, yeah, we're forming a, a group within NASA to study UAP. And now we have the one at the Pentagon. And now we have another one that's going to be a whole in the independent office. And the one thing that's that's been consistent since 2017 is that there has been a new program that was just about to start. And then all of a sudden it's replaced by another new program that's just about to start and a report that's just about to be released. And it's it, it seems like if you study the, the, the field going way back, and you know this, Jimmy, uh, this is just a, it's a playbook that's been in, in motion since, you know, the 40s. So we're not seeing anything new. We're just, see, we're not seeing a new script. We're not seeing a new movie. We're just seeing a remake. The, there must be, um, I don't know if you can comment on this directly, but I'm going to ask the question anyway. There must be <clears throat> those in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area that don't want MUFON involved in this, right? That They don't want you going in and, and talking to members and representatives and senators and, and, and getting involved. Have you, have you had that kind of pushback? No. Um, the the fact is that, you know, MUFON has been around for going on 55 years, and I will be the first to acknowledge that they've had their ups and downs, and that's an understatement. But the organization today is evolved. It's professional. It's tight. It's good at what they do. And there is no other organization on the planet that can do this. And what's really interesting is that we're not going to them asking for anything. They are more interested in what we can provide to them. And the reason is because we're the ones with 150,000 cases in our database. We're the ones with the largest body of independent research in, in, in our files. And this, inf this information and the sharing of some of this information is very valuable. And so nobody else brings that to the table. And nobody else has the reach that MUFON has. And nobody else has the... Uh, the ability to interact with the public in such a way that as information comes out, you know, people are going to have to have a place to go. They're going to have to have a place to find like minds. They're going to have to have a place to collectively reconcile the information. There's no other group on the planet that's better positioned to be an interface between the general civilian population and the information as it comes out. Yeah, but that's that. But that is my point, Ron. That that is what you guys bring to the table, and there has to be some in Washington that doesn't want that. Well, there, it's the same people that don't want the. If you're against the general release of that information, then you might be against us being involved in that general release. But I, we haven't detected any kind of direct targeting at MUFON that's not covered under that overall umbrella. It, there's been nothing but um, access meetings, um, conversations with people uh, beyond just committee staffers and stuff like that. I mean, real serious involvement. And they, uh, so, yeah, there might be people that are against the broad release of information and MUFON would get sucked up in that. But we haven't experienced anything where we've been singled out of, oh, we want disclosure, but we don't want them involved. Nothing like that has happened. Oh, I want to go back to a couple of points that you made at the beginning of the show. Um, uh, about uh, Bigelow uh, Aerospace in that and Bass, yes. that um, there was a lot of, uh, I'm going to say rumor, but also some public statements as well um, and, and stuff that was released into the press that I covered here and on Coast to Coast and, and I've had discussions uh, with many people about. And that is that Bigelow had a warehouse um, that was, you know, full of uh, crash debris. And my comment then, and we're going back many, many, many years here when, when these uh, stories started to surface, I had said then, if I was in possession of anything like that, I'm doing a press conference. 
I'm not going to hide behind anything. I am going to go public. I don't, you know, and, and, and that's it because it would be one of the greatest discoveries, if not the greatest statement and reveal in the history of mankind. And why would you sit on that? So you made that comment earlier about uh, Bigelow and, and, and crash debris. Do you believe that Bigelow Bass in any, uh, in any version of this was in possession of, of, of crash debris from an alien craft, or was that a smoke screen? Well, let me just say that accidental truth is called that for a reason. And the answer to that question is revealed in the film by anybody who's got enough common sense to see it when it happens. The, uh, the, the stuff that was studied at, at Bigelow Aerospace, there's a, there, there's a history here and I'm going to, some of this is, some of this is just my own opinion. Okay. So I don't, I'm not stating this is historical fact, but it seems to me that when uh, Robert Bigelow went on 60 Minutes and, and said aliens, he did the one thing that nobody else was able to do or would do. Uh, and we cover this in the film. He said the A word. Uh, look what happened to him immediately after that. Bigelow Aerospace uh, was basically shut down because of COVID. But what really happened is NASA stiffed him for his contracts, didn't pay him. His technology was cannibalized throughout private industry. All of his space habitats, everything else, other companies picked up the ball. Basically, I, I think, and again, this is just my opinion, and, and I've asked some people and they've said, well, no, that's not really what happened. But I don't believe those people. But my guess is that that was a punishment for going on and spilling the beans like that on 60 Minutes. And when the uh, and, and he paid a heavy price for it. You notice right after that, he went off to life after death. You know, he's not even involved in the E.T. stuff anymore or the conversation. But then he got the double whammy when the Freedom of Information Act requests uh, were dropped that exposed the fact that, um, and this is in the film too, not very many people know this and the people that do know it tried to debunk it. But the fact is that the Defense Intelligence Agency admitted that there was materials from crashed UAPs being uh, examined at Bigelow Aerospace. They, they admitted it in writing and we present this in the film. Um, now that was a double whammy for Bigelow because it's like he was just, he, he, he already got, um, you know, pretty much messed up from making the big reveal on 60 Minutes. He didn't need another big reveal about what was going on at Bass. So what you'll see is you'll see it in the film. And if you look at the, at the history of what was going on, um, right after this, there was a big flap at the Pentagon. There were certain guys that are big in our field going out, doing everything they could to debunk these FOIA releases and then all of a sudden we have these new stories. We have the New York Times saying, well, you know, we said that there was a warehouse built to house the parts, but we never said they were there. Then we have, um, you know, the whole story being walked back that there was materials. We have reporting from, from you know, credible reporters that, that, yes, there was materials there. Yes, there was materials there. Then all of a sudden, oh, no, no. No, I never no said that. Yeah, right, right, right. So, so what we have there is, I think that that Bigelow stuck his neck out on sixty minutes. I think he paid a price for it, and I think that when the whole big thing exploded onto the the scene about, oh yeah, materials at Bigelow Aerospace, and this is what they were, and this is blah blah blah. Um, th there was like no way he was going to be in a position to to you know be the fall guy for another big accidental truth. So, and, and for people who want to know what the, why that movie is called that, that's why, because the whole film is about accidentally revealing things that they do not want us to know and doing it in such a way that there's, you know, if you have any common sense and, and critical thinking, you watch this film and you're just going to shake your head and not because it's not a good film. You're going to shake your head because it's so pathetic what we're seeing unfold as the story gets revealed. Um, but yeah, so of course there was. And, okay. Now there is a difference. I could be wrong here, uh, Ron. There's a difference between backwards engineering a craft at Lockheed Skunk Works, a craft mm -hmm. and, and analyzing 
little melted pieces of metal that have been found in the ground, right? Yeah. Do you feel that's that's two different situations here? Do you think that Bigelow ever had uh, a component, you know, a component, a you know, a, 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 or did they only have slag and and melted materials? Well, you know, slag and melted materials. Jacques Vallée has got that stuff. There's nothing classified or um, or secret but you understand, about some you of understand, these materials. But you understand what I'm asking, right? There, there's a difference between a a, a flying saucer. Right. And then something else that you can't identify, even if it was this small, but you could look at it and go, oh, that, that's something. Um, but what do you think that Bigelow was in possession of? Well, you know, that's I don't want to go that far. I, I've been told a couple of things, but I don't know if they're true or not. And I, <laughs> I the, the film is really what can we prove? And so I don't want to add to the sea of speculation. One thing that I'm very careful about in putting out the film is that. Too many UFO documentaries, they get you to the point where, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And then all of a sudden we got bases on Mars and, and you know, and I'm time traveling, you know. And so I have I have this test. I call it the Midwest bar test. It's And it basically says that if you were to walk into a bar in the Midwest and you were to sit down with just average Americans sitting around having beer, eating hot dogs and say, I'm into UFOs. And they said, really? Well, what do you think? And you say, well, I think that there's a good uh, body of evidence that there's been an extraterrestrial and uh, um, imprint on humanity from day one. I think the government knows a lot more than they're saying. And I think that there's, you know, pretty much 100 percent positive uh, um, action that there's life off of Earth. Everybody in that Midwest bar with their beer, they go, yeah, 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 sure, man. No, no problem. I get that. That's pretty profound. But then if you go on to say, and, um, you know, I used to be 20 years old and I got time regressed and, and went to Mars and then I came back and I used to fight bugs and, uh, and, and I live in a secret space fleet and we time travel. And OK, now all of a sudden the guys in the Midwest bar are gathering around you and they're going to kick your ass. Yeah. And so. Yeah. If it doesn't pass the Midwest bar test, other people can address that. I'm not going to be that guy. So I, I have put out a film about what we can prove. And as Ralph Blumenthal says in the film, what we can prove is compelling enough. And I'll leave the, the speculation and the wild stories, which may or may not be true. I'm not denigrating anybody's stuff, but it's just not the place that I want to be. So when we talk about, well, what do I think was at Bigelow's place? Um, it's irrelevant what I think. The um, uh, the comment that was made in the Wilson Davis uh, document, which I thought was extremely profound, is the three guys from, I'm going to say Lockheed. We don't know if it was Lockheed, but I think we can, yeah. you know, you know, betting man is going to say that it was Lockheed. But the three guys. So you've got uh, uh, a research guy, you've got a lawyer, and you've got the head of security, Right. And they said, uh, allegedly, again, uh, to Admiral Wilson, uh, we have a craft and we think it can fly. That's a pretty, I mean, that one line still to this day, I mean, it just really sticks out. Do you, do you believe that private industry is in possession of uh, a craft not of this earth that is intact and, and can fly? Yeah, absolutely. The, there's been there's evidence of multiple reverse engineering programs that were funded and that were canceled because of a lack of progress. Eric Davis talks about it, uh, who is the other half of the Wilson Davis memo uh, pair. Um, and he would know he's he's knee deep in all this stuff. You know, the, if you look at the uh, it's it's the same people all the way back to to the bird names. You know, it's it's Alexander. It's put off. It's it's. Uh, Eric Davis was part of it. These are all the guys that were circling around trying to get to the to the guys that were deeper. And they were read into a certain amount of stuff going way back a enough to say, OK, you know, look, John, we need you to say Roswell wasn't real. But here's what really happened. And so so you got these guys that are kind of they're straddling the line, I believe. But um, is there an intact craft? Yeah, I think that there is. And I think. Lou Elizondo actually, uh, you know, I'm sure you remember this. He he told uh, Danny Sheehan that he had 
seen an intact craft. And Danny Sheehan said something and it got Lou into a lot of trouble and he had to walk it back. And we cover this in the movie, uh, the, um, the, what, what happened there. It's like, well, it's the same story on Bigelow and crash materials. Well, I, I went to a place that was set up for, to have an intact craft, but I didn't see an intact craft, but the, uh, the, the threads of the story of unsuccessful reverse engineering programs, uh, there's a lot of them. There's consistency in them, and we only need one of them to be true. But I think, yeah, I think that they've recovered craft, uh, and but they haven't been able to figure out how to how to work some of them. And I think they've had some success with others. Now, uh, back to the path forward. Do you think that we'll have another hearing uh, either in the Senate or the House uh, this year? I, I'm sure we will. Yeah, there's, of course, you know, the, the geopolitical situation is a big thing. The political upheaval is a big thing. Uh, a lot of people think that back when uh, TTSA rolled out, part of the plan was that Hillary was going to win, you know, then the Podesta crowd and the, and the bill crowd, everybody was going to get in and they were going to be able to really move forward the uh, disclosure agenda. But then when Trump won, um, and I'm not getting political here. I'm just saying that that, that that changed the landscape. And so this plan of disclosure that could have gone all the way to Hillary Clinton, Steve Bassett is a big proponent that this was really in the works. Um, it, it, I think that what happened is that all got changed. And so that's when the, the whole TTSA rollout and everything else, they got thrown on their back feet by the fact that they didn't have that pipeline to, to some sort of disclosure that had already been kind of arranged. And that's when the people that oppose it had a chance to regain their footing and come back fighting. So it's a lot of whether or not we have significant hearings are going to depend on two things, the action of the body politic, what's happening, the geopolitical situation, so put those into one category. And then the, um, the other thing is going to be how fast they enact that law um, and rather or not the whistleblowers come forward. I do have information that there's work being done inside of DIA. Danny Sheehan will talk about this. Um, they are trying to kind of form that pathway for UFO whistleblowers to be able to come forward. And that legislation is the beginning of that. Um, how long that's all going to take to unfold is, you know, anybody's guess. But there is rumblings that there's going to be a new set of hearings and guys like Eric Davis and possibly Admiral Wilson and people that that uh, are in the know and credible make at some point come forward. I know that there's some of them that want to. Is there a way uh, to get the Air Force to cooperate? Where the uh, out of all of the branches of the military, you would think that it would be the Air Force that is got the most data and the most footage and the most eyewitness uh, interaction and, and and probably goes beyond that than any other branch of the military. But they they have seriously stopped this train and and their involvement with this. Everything has uh, come out almost exclusively. Uh, from the United States Navy. Is there a way to get to the Air Force or are they too com comfortable with doing their own thing? Well, you know, the Air Force is conspicuously absent because the Air Force is right, Patterson. The Air Force is, is the whole, everything that was happening back when this whole thing was initiated. And they have been arguably the biggest guardian of this information. The Navy might be encountering these, these craft, but the Air Force holds the keys to the kingdom. And they are, in my opinion, they're being quiet for a reason because they want to keep the, the spotlight off of them because there's too many questions that can be directly asked to the Air Force that they're going to have to answer. One of the things that we cover in the film, it's it's an old story, but it but we were able to, to prove that it's true. The Blue Room, the, the, the room of Wright-Patterson Air Force Base that was rumored to have uh, be a storage repository for crash debris and, and technology and even bodies. And it was there was a rumor that there was a film shot of this room. And we found the Freedom of Information Act trail where the existence of that film was denied, was denied, was denied until it finally got to an office that safeguarded media the Blue Room footage from the Air Force's uh, at Wright-Patterson 
was an actual media project that had an actual name that had a actual media number and a date of its destruction. And so the Wright Patterson Blue Room story is, is appears to be true just based on that and some of the other accounts like from Barry Goldwater. So the Air Force is knee deep in this more than probably any of the other services. And um, if you go back to the early history of the Air Force of Wright Patterson, um, and Battelle Memorial Institute and night and all, uh, you know, that's, that's basically where that stuff came from. The Battelle had a contract with Wright Patterson to do material studies. Night and all is a, uh, um, it's, it's a metal that they knew very little about back in that time. It's a titanium alloy. Uh, there was a scientist at Battelle that kind of figured out night and all passed it off to the Naval Weapons Research Laboratory, but it originated from Battelle because they were given materials from Wright-Patterson to study. And then the history of that was all covered up. So the Air Force is knee deep in this further than probably any branch of the service. Uh, Chris Mellon wrote about this uh, a couple of years ago in one of his op-eds. And in the breakdown of that, uh, there was this one one paragraph that uh, stood out, uh, at least for me, um, and not much was made of this in the media. And I would have thought that a really good journalist, you know, would have jumped on that and said, OK, what's going on here? And turn around and question the Pentagon. And the point of this is Chris said that there was a secure, secure chat room inside of the Pentagon where all of the branches of the military could collectively get together and, and talk about UAPs and, and what they have learned. And the Air Force found out that there were some Air Force personnel participating in that chat room and literally sent out a directive that no Air Force personnel are to participate in that secure chat room about UAPs. And, and when Mellon wrote that, I said, just wait a minute here. Isn't that exactly what they should be doing? But nobody followed up on that, Ron. Yeah, um, the Air Force is knee deep in this. And they've got the thing is, is they've got the most documented history with this stuff. If you talk to guys like Michael Stratt, who could tell you the whole story, he could tell you the name of the plane that picked up the stuff from Roswell, where it flew all the way down to the name of the pilot. The thing is, is they, they can't whitewash a lot of this history going back to you could argue rather this started around the Roswell time with that incident or others like it or mm -hmm. World War II. You can you can you can have that debate. But the Air Force was instrumental in all of that, in that transition between Army to Air Force. This was all going on. And um, so that they, they've got the uh, the Navy might have the Tic Tacs, but the Air Force has the pedigree. And the the other part with uh, the path moving forward are the you know citizens of, of this country you know the the constituents and so forth is that enough of a, a force uh, to cause action in in Washington D.C. and they uh, you, you can't you know necessarily uh, keep your head in the sand or not have the motivation to go and ask questions and to move this forward. It, it those are elected officials by us. Is that enough of a motivation? Well, here's how it was explained to me. If enough people, politicians, you know, at the end of the day, think of them however you will, they're into their own self-preservation. If everybody in, in a congressman's district, a huge number of people, an influential number of people, a number of people that could influence his ability to be reelected were to push this issue with him, he would push the issue. The problem is there is not enough collective will among the people to rise up and demand the truth. Uh, and that's probably never going to change because people are distracted with their daily lives The you know, nobody's going to get elected to Congress because they promise they're going to pull it off the UFO thing. They're most more likely to, to get laughed away even today. So the answer is yes. If enough of us go and make enough noise, to the point where these guys have to listen to us just because of the sheer numbers, we will be able to make a lot more headway than if we don't do that. Because this is a it's a, it's a it's a spooky topic at best. Even if you're a politician in Washington that would be willing to look into it, you're still going to face a certain amount of ridicule. 
Tim Burchett, it was the biggest thing that challenged his reelection is people making fun of him about the UFO thing. He did win reelection, thank goodness. But um, yeah, these guys, they'll, they'll do it to a point. And, and that point will be my constituents are demanding the truth in vast numbers. I'm going to have to to take some action right up until the point where he gets pulled into that room and told why he's not going to do it. There was, uh, let's stay on uh, Burchett for a second. His comments after the the hearing, I think were more important than the hearing itself. And he was using words like sham, that this this hearing was a sham, that our government, my government, he said, is lying to us and, and lying to the people. Uh, those are really, really big words. Why do you think that the the conversation started uh, back in 2017 where suddenly disclosure and UFOs were allowed to be talked about in, in a public forum and to have somebody like Tim Burchett uh, come out and say these things. So why the change? Well, it, it was all the media thing that happened with Lou and Chris. They went to the, to the New York Times. They got the New York Times to publish the story. That lit a fire. <clears throat> it lit a huge fire. And so when you have people coming from, you know, inside government, the former undersecretary of defense for intelligence, a guy that was, uh, you know, high up the ladder at the defense intelligence agency, these are, these are real government insiders coming out with a bombshell. And so, yeah, it ignited the conversation and there was no getting away from it. And in well, accidental. Do you think that something happened before that though? Something allowed Mellon to to be in that comfort zone so, and you know and steve justice right and 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 jim semivan and, and others to just uh start speaking about this in such a public way leaking well, these, yeah these guys have been talking about this for a long time you know lou really was uh, and i do believe in that he was frustrated with the fact that he wasn't getting the attention inside of government but what i think he didn't know is that he was he wasn't getting attention inside of government because that's a policy the 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 front facing military are are part of the ridicule factor not part of the let's investigate this and i'm mm -hmm. not sure he he understood that at the time but you know these guys got together and said yeah we're going to go and there was a certain amount of green lighting nobody got got in their way and opposed them I'm sure there were discussions within the classified community about what they were going to be able to say and what they can't. We cover that in Accidental Truth. But this thing didn't just happen all of a sudden. One day, Lou decides to call Leslie King. This was something right. that was in the works for a really long time. Yes. And it was an organized rollout of information with, with, with approvals all the way across the board. And you were asking me about Tim Burchett. You know, I went to Washington and I went to his office and I interviewed him. I shot an hour, an hour interview with two cameras and we talked about all of it. I'll, I'll post the interview on YouTube uh, at some point. But, you know, there's a there's a part where I'm like, you know, Tim. This all started before Roswell, but here's what happened. And I gave him the Reader's Digest version of everything face to face, him and me. And it turns out that he has had a passion for this topic. He's a sci-fi fan. I mean, he's just into the UFO thing, just like a you know an average person, which is why I had him move on, um, skyping in. We had a great conversation in front of the uh, the crowd at the Buffon Symposium. He's personally involved, and he knows about the the BS just like we do because he's been in our position. He's kind of like Tom DeLonge was at one time, you know, somebody that even though he's got some fame and notoriety, he's 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 a nerd ufologist at heart, and 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 Tim is 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 like that, and he's you know he's very personable. Um, but we talked for a long time, and the interview is is stunning. Some of the best parts of it are in Accidental Truth, but I'll put it out at some point. But he is making those comments not as a insider that knows stuff that we don't know. He's making those comments as another frustrated ufologist who who knows the same kind of stuff that we do. And uh, when it comes to SAPs, and so much um, has been revealed, uh, the public in general knows nothing about an SAP. They don't. Our community we're starting to learn more and more about them. Um, but the companies that benefit from those programs um, have been completely sheltered. And the, the, the paper trail 
the assignment numbers to government documents, the document numbers, and the way to go and, fi- and find and, and release and comment on these things, that doesn't apply in a special access program. Those corporations and those people and those names are completely sheltered. Mm-hmm. Is this something that should be discussed publicly or should some things remain a secret? Well, you know, that's it, it it's, depends on the context again. The special access programs, the whole way these things are structured is for plausible deniability and for the ability to shield from Freedom of Information Act requests. There's a, this, the structure of the special access programs, the way they're integrated with private industry and very small factions of government were built that way on purpose. And you'd have to look at each one of them to say, well, should we know about this? Should we not know about that? Uh, you know, a lot of special access programs have given us breakthrough technologies that are very useful. There's a reason they exist. And right. there's a reason that they're secret. So you can't put a blanket thing about exposing them. Um, but I think that the, uh, you know, this lack of accountability is you could say, well, that it's evil that if you if you're hiding technology that could give us free energy or that could advance humanity in such a way that we can stop our self-destructive path or any of these other things that would benefit the greater good. And you're sitting on that technology. That is some would call it a crime against humanity. But if you're sitting on technology that we have no business having, like, you know, say there's an energy source that, that could give us free energy, but if it's misused, mishandled, could destroy the whole planet, could blow us into another dimension. Well, maybe there's a reason for keeping that under wraps. So unfortunately, we can't just make a blanket assumption about that we deserve to know all the truth. And this was the most bitter pill for me to swallow is because this movie took me a year and a half to, to put together. And it's got material that I shot as far back as 2008. Um and over the course of making the film, I've been surveilled. I've been threatened. I, I, there was a little bit of a time when I wasn't even sure that I was going to be able to put this film out. And I'm pretty convinced at this point that I'm not putting it out, that it's not reaching the public because of my tenacity. It's going to reach the public because for some reason it's going to be allowed to reach the public. But I was scared to death for months on this thing. Um, and I didn't know who to trust. I didn't know who I could talk to. Uh, it, it got really, really strange. I'm just so glad it's done. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, you cannot fault the people that are keeping these secrets. There's a reason for some of it. And then there, some of it is just, they've been keeping the secret for so long and they've dug such a deep hole. How do they possibly dig out of it without how, there being a whole they, lot of how, problems? Yeah, Ron, that's 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 like the best point uh, that could be made about this, which is, so the reveal happens, uh, whatever that reveal is, but what would freak out, what would piss off the planet more? Um, you've known about E.T. and you've been sitting on this information. Okay, I think we can. Or you mean you've been sitting on free energy that could have powered our schools and heated mm-hmm. the homes? And, and fed the world you've been sitting I think that would piss a few people off yeah and see that's where it really becomes questionable uh, and and there are people that would have to be accountable for that and they can't let this information out until all those people are dead and there's there's this institutional memory that we have but there's also one thing that really shocked me as I was researching this is that these agencies and these people and these organizations and even you know within the military you would think that they would preserve something like in raiders of the lost ark they went and put it in a warehouse they have no problem whatsoever destroying things like they never even happened the you know the 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 video and the or the the film the photos the debris everything from roswell it may have just been destroyed. It might not even be sitting in a warehouse somewhere because these people will do those kinds of things. And so, um, the, yeah, the crime against humanity element is huge. The uh, the established, I'm going to say status quo. I'm going to go with status quo, even though you can't find a definition for it. But my version of status quo is, you know, what is just out there running and moving along, right? And that's it. It's just, it's just plugging along. Elected officials 
the status quo of the SAP programs and the way that that is run and everything else, they run in the comfort zone of knowing that, well, four years, they're out of office, eight years at best. Oh, right. Yeah. And, and, and that's how they operate. And the stuff that's in those SAP programs or any information that is there is never making it into the Oval Office. There's no way to overwhelm uh, any sitting president with, you know, a million pages of, of crazy. You, you just wouldn't do that, that you, you need to run the government and do other things on a day to day basis. You're not going to be overwhelmed with what's going on in Palmdale. Yeah, presidents quit being read in. I, everybody in the field knows that it probably ended with Reagan, possibly Bush. Um, you know, somebody's saying something about the lighting. Is there any way to... to uh, that's that? you. That's you. You've got your automatic lighting is is running, your sensitivity on your camera. Uh, this is a different computer. Because I've got so much light on me right now that I can't even see. That <laughs> I look like I'm sitting in a dark room. Yeah, I turn off all automation. All of my stuff is in manual. Uh, with my cameras and I can't even find a place to control. Yeah, it. Don't okay. Do it. Well, sorry, people. I'm in the dark. That's that's okay. No, you look fine. Why? Did, you don't want to see Ron lit up. Everybody, trust me on this. I've seen. Oh, Ron, yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, you don't want to see Ron lit up. Uh, I like the darker version. Um, no, you look fine. Um, but is is that's that's the thing? They know that the turnover is going to happen in, in Washington. That's it. And the career SAP program runners are doing it for 30, 40, 50 years at a crack or longer. And there's, there's just no way that uh, anybody is going to be sharing that information. Yeah, of course. And the, um, Oh, that's funny. So yeah, I'm, I'm going to quit looking at that. So see, the, I see, see. Yeah. That's why you don't pay attention to the chat room. This is a professional show. If I ever did, that, <laughs> if I ever did that on set, okay. The next time you and I are shooting, Ron. Oh, look, there's okay I, during the shoot. I'm going to go. Hold on, let me check my, let me check my email. Yeah, let me, let, I think somebody sent me a text. Okay, so I'm going to do that to you. Um, but again, the path forward. So what is next then? What is next is that people that we don't know are making the decisions about what we're going to be told and how we're going to be told it. And there is nothing that we're going to be able to do about it. The, the, there's not going to be any kind of gigantic peel back that is not engineered, approved and implemented. Uh, I wish that it was going to be different. But right. unfortunately, I don't believe that that's the case. I think that there is a general understanding that through throughout all of the people involved in this, that humanity needs to be enlightened to at least some better extent than we are now. But are they ever going to tell us everything? No, I don't think so. Are they ever going to tell us uh, some of the implications of this? No. Is there secret space programs and all this stuff that's that far out maybe are we ever going to know all of the information we're not and and you know we talk about that in the film also uh you know nick pope is is very interesting because i have him in 2009 um uh, you know that we have a little line in the film that says that you know nick pope denied any existence of a government program right up until he didn't and in 2009 he's like well Certainly people have looked at some of these topics, but there's never been any kind of uh, government UFO program. And then it cuts to Nick Pope in 2019. We now know of a government UFO program, but we probably don't know about the government UFO program. And so, you know, it's kind of like we're, we're never going to get all of the information and what information we do get is going to be carefully orchestrated, digested and released to fit the new narrative. These, now, these report you know what I did uh, last week? I, I, it's funny that you bring this up because just last week I pulled down my my old copy of uh, Above Top Secret, right? Timothy Good. Mm -hmm. And I had remembered that he had wrote um, about in the book uh, about, and you got to remember when that book came out, right? It's, 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 it's quite a while ago. 1990, I think is, is, is when it came out when I got my first copy, the, um, the pages that he wrote on this was about 
a staffed building. I can't remember the city. I just read it. Uh, but he said it was 50 miles northwest of London. There was a building that was permanently staffed with 50 people from the MOD that were investigating and and had radar operations running on uh, for UFOs. And that was in 1990. So I went back and I, and I found the pages, and there it was. And he also said in there, and this predates Nick Pope, right? Um, uh, he also said in there that in this building that they tracked a UFO um, on radar, I believe, uh, I'll go back, I'll, I'll email you tomorrow, three days, three days in the air, three days. <laughs> yeah. A, 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 a traditional plane right? Is running out of gas after, after so many hours, um, is going to run out of fuel or whatever. But this was something that went down for three days. And so the, the MOD has had a permanently staffed building and it's never stopped, uh, with 50 people covering this subject. And, and they've been doing it, uh, according to, uh, Timothy Good for decades. Oh yeah, never. They, they never stopped investigating after the first evidence of this stuff, and and they're still doing it now. And so we've got a we've got a very established government insider in Accidental Truth that talks about uh, sensors picking up UFOs all the time, huge varieties of them, and they've they've captured UFOs a mile wide, according to him, and it's routine. And so you know the just getting closer and closer to. Uh, peeling away different layers of the onion or, you know, in, in accidental truth, we try to use an ice pick to chip away uh, more of the statue because, you know, it's time that the gloves come off and we do that a little bit in the film. So um, yeah, but the information that we're getting is the information that it's been decided that we're going to get and we're getting it in the manner that it's been decided that we're going to get. And the people that are making those decisions are the same ones that we talk about that we, we don't know who they are. Ron, I want to thank you uh, for everything uh, that you have done and contributed uh, to our community over the decades. And you're very tireless in, in what you do. And uh, do we have a tentative date for the release of the film? Uh, supposedly between March 15th and the end of March. Oh, so next month, month and a half. Yeah, and yeah. It's uh, the, the trailers, the official trailer will be out. Uh, probably next week we're putting the finishing touches on it. One of the uh, same company that made the trailer for Maverick is doing the trailer for this. Uh, the distributor is kind of going all out on it. And then, um, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting when it comes out and I've got two and a half months of, I thought I could take a break when I finished the film, but forget it. I'm not, I, I've, I've got to go into marketing mode and podcast mode and everything else. It's going to be awesome, man. I'm very excited for this. And uh, it, it, it's time that uh, people start uh, observing the truth. And that's what the film was about, Accidental Truth. Thank you so much. Ron hey, James. do you have one more second? Sure. You can do whatever you want. It's your you show. Want, you, want, you want to see something funny? Yeah, what people do you got? People are like, well, okay, Ron, you finished the film. What are you doing? And so, you know, we're all artists, right? So I'm spending a lot of time doing the music. But I also, I used to own a t-shirt printing company and, and I've wanted to dabble in it again. So I bought one of those machines that prints on t-shirts okay. and I have, I have it set up in my house and I've been designing t-shirts. So I did a whole bunch and I'm not trying to sell t-shirts. I'm not even going to tell you guys where these are, but this is one of the designs I did. Um, Desert Essentials. It's got the flying saucer drive flying oh, down there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so that's pretty I cool. I want that. I want that. And then uh, this is another one I came up with. Um, and I designed these and then I actually printed them in, in, here at my house. Uh, Roswell Garage. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. And then I, I've come up with a line for music. I actually did some artwork in AI and I came up with a... Uh, a, a, a brand called rock and destiny and then these are like really dark haunting musically themed t-shirts like this one's called dance the, this design was actually created by artificial intelligence and i and i i fixed it up and put it on the shirt and like this one too this is one of my favorites i call it one man band it's just dude oh, oh that's with, tasty with with skeletons playing yeah 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 yeah, yeah. that's tasty 
And then, of course, we have the Accidental Truth t-shirt, which is really cool. And so then one other thing, I bought a 3D printer and I am designing <laughs> I'm designing the uh, the MUFON 55th anniversary sculptures. And so this is all something I, I, I built it in a 3D animation program um, and have been experimenting with the 3D printer printing them. I, I built the base. And so I am so sick of looking at a computer screen and doing video production that I've put my show on ice and I am, you know, I'm in my basement building models of flying saucers. I, I'll get back to the show at some point, but I need a break. Man, I love it, man. I absolutely love it. I want that desert shirt. You've got I'll my send you one. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't have it, but uh, send it to me. And I'm going to be out in LA next week. So maybe we can get together. Yeah, let's hang out. Let's hang out. Let's break some bread. All right. Okay. Ron James, thank you so much, my friend. Behave, be well. Good luck with the film. It's going to be amazing, and we need it. Thank you so much. Hey, so somebody's asking me about the, the pedestal. If there's a way that they can reach me, the 3D printing is a pain in the butt, let me tell you. It is. <laughs> you, well, uh, it's, you, you're, you're on Twitter. You're on Facebook. You have your website. You have MUFON. There's yeah, you can reach me through MUFON's Facebook page. That's an easy way to reach me. Mm -hmm. Just go to MUFON's Facebook Absolutely. That the pedestal reminds me of Lockheed's uh, facility out here where they did all of the uh, radi uh, radar uh, cross uh, sensor readings. Yeah. So well, fire. you know what it is, is it somebody built a model of a panel on the Death Star. And I thought, you know, this looks kind of like S4. Uh, you know, it looks like some remote place. So, so I did that and then I found a, a, a the stand and i actually integrated it into one piece of three of 3d it takes a day to print it 24 hours uh, it, but yeah it's it's been a it's been trial by fire in the uh in the 3d printing thing and then the roswell flying saucer this is this is something you can get anywhere and it prints in a, in a few pieces my girlfriend just came back from from the studio in la and there's flying saucer parts all over the kitchen. <laughs> what are you doing? You know, like, well, that's what happens when you leave me alone for too long. <laughs> <laughs> Ron James. Sorry, I'm still not sure about that. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I, oh, is that Siri? Yeah, you know, I don't know what this is, but my watch is listening to me. I was talking to, to, to the dog the other day and, and, you know, doing that pet talk. Oh, you're just so cute. You know, like that. And Siri on my watch starts laughing. I'm like, no, this is, this is just wrong. You know, I have, I have a smart house, but I have no, I have no Alexa. I have no listening devices here. Uh, no, no, that, that, that part kind of freaks me out. That's why yeah. right there, Ron, be safe, be well, um, and, and stay dry. The rain is coming your way. And, uh, there you go. Thank you so much. Yeah, Ron. I'm headed for Laguna beach next week. So I'll be out there. Hopefully I can miss it. It'll be dry. I'll talk. Bye, to everybody you. in the chat room. You can find me if you want to talk to me. I'll see you, Ron. Thank you so much. Ron James, and, and the links for Ron's new film is uh, below, and uh, it's accidentaltruths.com. Uh, the links are below, and as soon as the trailer hits, I will let everybody know in social media, and, of course, the premiere day, too, as well. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. And let's see, tomorrow night, I've got Patricia Corey, all the way from the Azores, is going to be with us, talking about her new book, which I have here. It's called Hacking the God Code. That's tomorrow night on Fade to Black. Fade to Black is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Webmaster is Drew the Geek Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy, SpaceBoyMusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2023 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tomorrow night, Patricia Corey. Until then, be safe. Go Beckley Tappy.